Have you ever had a case of mistaken identity? Has someone ever thought that you were somebody else? I remember I used to drive a, um, a black four-door sedan, right? Uh, uh, and I remember, I think it was a, a Lumina. It wasn't a particularly government-looking vehicle, but I was dressed up, and I was with another person from the church, and so both of us were probably looked like we were in our late 20s, early 30s, and we're both wearing, uh, we're wearing suits and ties, and we come up to this guy's house, and we knock on his door. He had visited the church, or at least someone had put his name in that he was asking for a visit. And so we get there and we knock on the door and he just peeks his head, like he just peeks that part of his head out of the little crack in his door to look at us. And, um, you know, he's, he's just holding the door at a very awkward angle and we're wondering what's, what's going on here. And um, we introduced ourselves, who we were, said so we were from the church. And he says, so you're not with the FBI? I said, no, we're not. And he breathes this sigh of relief and opens the door a little bit more, but masks his right hand. So we could only guess what it was that was in his right hand, but apparently he had reason to be suspicious that the FBI was going to show up at his house. He, he thought that we were, it's actually your son who was with me. He must have thought that we were, we were um, government agents. So I'm glad that that mistaken identity did not lead us into all sorts of trouble, and it could have. Many people are unclear about their religious beliefs. And often people don't even think about what they believe until they're forced to. You know, we had a funeral this past week for one of our church members that went home to be with the Lord, uh, Brother Doug Davis. And sometimes funerals force you to think about, well, what happens after this life? And where am I going? And what am I doing with my life right now? It's one of the good effects of funerals as it causes us to take note of the directions we're headed. But unless we're prompted with something like that in our way, it's easy to not consider those things and to not be clear about it. Or we can end up using vague words or vague notions. People toss around the term God all the time, but you're not entirely sure what they mean when they say God. Oftentimes, people might mean something that you don't mean. And so you're sitting here, perhaps, sharing with them about your faith in God, and they think you mean something completely different. Or maybe you've heard the term, I'm re- or the phrase, I'm religious, but I'm not, or excuse me, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. I I remember there was a a gentleman that I knew, and it was a very ironic situation. He had had almost his entire upper body covered in tattoos of Catholic iconography, all sorts of different saints, Mary, Jesus. I mean, he had had an entire montage going on and, and then no longer believed in the Catholic Church. And so then he's stuck with all of this all over his body, and his phrase is, well, I'm not really religious anymore, but I I still am spiritual. And so what ends up happening, and even extremely religious people that go to a place with lots of ceremony and lots of ritual, they might even miss God in the midst of all of that. And when we're not clear, we may end up with a a case of mistaken identity on what it is we believe, or other people may end up. And why is it that it's important? that we are clear on these issues and we help other people be clear. And what might happen if we ourselves or others uh, allow themselves to continue in this vague sense of religion? Well, today, Paul and Barnabas, they're in a new city, in a new area, as we continue in our series on Acts, and it's populated, from what we can tell, almost exclusively by Gentiles. And it ends up with a huge misunderstanding. So in Acts chapter 14, beginning in verse number 8, the Word of God says this, And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who had never, excuse me, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, and steadfastly beholding him, and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lyconia, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter, and Paul Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands under the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people, which, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs, why do ye ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you and Preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God, 
which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness and that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruit and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, scarce restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that you'd open your word to us. We thank you for its power. I pray that you would be in our midst using it to help us to know you better. I pray that you would confront us with these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So after leaving Iconium, where Paul and Barnabas saw a great number of people saved, but also great opposition, it divided the city, and they knew that there was an assault that was about to be made upon them, and for their own uh, safety's sake, they were taken out of the city and left the city, and they wound up in this area called Lyconia. And while they were there, they were in a few different cities, Lystra and, and Derby. and so here they are in the city of Lystra, and there's a man there. And he's described in verse number eight of being impotent in his feet, no strength whatsoever in his feet or in his legs, being a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. So here's a man who is now grown, and from the time that he was a child had no use of his legs whatsoever. We're not told the exact malady, if he was just paralyzed from that or if there was some sort of um, a deformity that happened, but he was disabled from perhaps his waist down from what we can tell. And when you were disabled in that way in these times, life was brutal. Life was brutal. It's not easy in any age, but at least in the modern age, there are things like accessibility and wheelchairs and things that people think about when they're trying to help folks have uh, a way in and out of the building. There's even code about that. You can get in trouble if you have a building and you don't keep up to the governmental codes on accessibility. But back then, you were just a drain on your family because you couldn't work. There were no social programs that were going to help you. There may be people that would give you money as a beggar. But it was a very unfulfilling life. It was a terrible place to be in. Life was hard for everybody in times gone by, but especially for this gentleman. And here, God made sure that this person was there and was listening to Paul when Paul was preaching in this city. It says in verse number nine, the same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed. Pause before we continue on into what happens after Paul locked eyes with this man. It says that he heard Paul speak. What was it that Paul was speaking? Well, if we jump back to verse number seven that we saw last week, it says, and there they preached the gospel. They'd made their way into Lystra and Derby, and what they had to give was the gospel message. And so they came into this city that was almost entirely Gentile. And you say, what does it mean when a, something, someone is a Gentile? Well, they are a, not a Jewish person. It's everybody outside of the Jewish nation of the Jewish ethnicity. And so you have right now these people that believe in their own pagan gods. They have a pantheon of many gods. Maybe you had to study the Greek and Roman gods sometime when you were a child as you studied history. I remember going through that stuff in like sixth grade. We, we did a, a history on all sorts of the ancient world. And so they actually believed that. That would have been their, their system of gods. And so when they come in and they start speaking with them, they, they don't have a synagogue to go to. We don't read about them doing that pattern where they would normally go to a place where people were ready and waiting for the news of the Messiah and had believed the promises of the Old Testament. And so what did they do? Well, they were there. They preached the gospel to whoever they could find. And there was obviously a gathering of people here. There were crowds of people who had gathered around to hear what they had to say. And so when the same heard Paul speak, so sharing the gospel, who steadfastly beholding him, Paul's eyes were fixed on him. You can almost imagine in your mind that Paul is speaking and he sees this man over there who is perhaps laying down on his side for the inability to hold himself in any other position. And it says, beholding him and perceived that he had faith to be healed. There was some supernatural understanding that the apostle Paul was given when looking upon this man, that he had faith. And when we say faith, what do we mean? That he had belief, he had trust in the words that Paul was saying, trust in the Messiah that he was preaching, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that there was some connection between the faith, the type of faith this man had, and the openness of God working through the apostles in order to see him miraculously healed. And in verse number 10, it says, said with a loud voice, stand upright on thy feet. 
What an unrealistic, what an unkind, what, what a ridiculous, in some sense, thing to say to a man who is impotent of his feet, who has no power, who is paralyzed. The last thing that this man could do would be to jump upright onto his feet. Not to mention, he had never walked. When it says that he was crippled from his mother's womb, that means that he never took those steps as a toddler, those wobbly steps. He never learned to, to go into a smooth gait in his walk. He had never had a time where he'd run through the streets with his peers from all the way as a child, all the way up. The man had never learned to walk. And so even if he suddenly could stand up, there was no expectation for him to have any balance whatsoever. But as we find, as powerless as this man was, as unable as he was to do these things, he tried to stand up anyway. You say, how do you know? Because the end of that verse says, in verse number 10, and he leaped and walked. So he got up and he starts leaping around the area and walking around the area where everybody is gathered. And we know that there's a lot of people because in just a few moments there's going to be an uproar and everyone's going to be very excited, though they're going to go the wrong direction with their excitement. They're going to take it the wrong... So here's a man who had no power, but what he did have was faith. And he had the faith to try and stand up. And when he did, he found that power was there. It's not unlike you and I when we are called to do something that we look at and might say, that's impossible. But when we step out, trusting that God is going to meet us, we find the strength to do what we thought was impossible because the Lord called us to do it. We rise to God's command to do what seemed impossible and we find his strength there. Primarily, what the Apostle Paul and what Barnabas did was they went around preaching the gospel. They also did miracles. And so God used this man and this miracle to open wide the city for them. So there was no synagogue that was a good starting place, but there was this man, and he was willing to believe on Christ, and through that, through his testimony, as he was blessed, the whole city heard and started to pay very close attention to what was going on, even without having some sort of uh, in there. Verse number 11. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lyconia, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. So the crowds are there. The crowds are watching. This man's still walking and leaping and running around. And they, they yell out something in a foreign tongue, and they're really excited about it. You can see there's joy on their faces. There's wonder on their faces. But it's the tongue, the speech of Lyconia. It's, it's not Greek, because... Paul and Barnabas would have understood that. It was obviously not one of the languages they were familiar with. It was some local dialect of the area. So the Apostle Paul and Barnabas, they didn't know what was going on, but they're like, wow, maybe they really got it. These people probably also spoke Greek as you had many different uh, cultures that adopted Greek as a language and the cultures of the Greek people. It was sort of the easy way to, to speak through folks around this area of the Roman Empire. And they, they thought that the Roman gods, little g, are come down to us in the likeness of men. There were all sorts of stories about their gods, little g. And they, if you ever read some of their mythology, some of it is very wild. Their gods are very capricious, meaning that they're petty, that they get upset at just about anything, and they're willing to engage in all sorts of behavior that we would look down as humans. Their gods were no greater than they were. In fact, their gods oftentimes were worse than they were. And that's the imagination of a man at work. That's the imagination of a woman at work, is that they imagine that their gods are just like them, except maybe a little more powerful. Maybe they have a little more glory and honor. So these are like their superheroes, is what they've come up with in their pantheon, because it's something that they can understand. And so throughout many years, they... They believed this. And so when they saw real power, they took that and went the wrong direction with it. And much false religion today comes from an incomplete understanding of the true and living God. You have people that will point back and they'll say, oh yeah, we look back to Abraham, but they've missed out on the God of Abraham. At some point, either departing from him, like those that would uh, cl claim the Jewish faith today, not believing in the Messiah that God sent to them, the Lord Jesus Christ. Or you have the, the Muslim folks that would point back and say, we also trace our lineage all the way back to Abraham. And yet they take that idea and they've run the wrong direction with it. 
and they've ended up somewhere where they're not supposed to be, what God did not intend for them to have. So what ends up happening when they run in this wrong direction? In verse 12, it says, they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. So they went through their pantheon to try and figure out which gods are these. We just saw a powerful miracle. We all knew this guy. This guy has been like this since a child. There was no way that he suddenly learned to walk and jump up and leap around other than a great miracle is done. So they assume that Paul and Barnabas are gods. And so they call Paul Jupiter or Zeus, right? He was the, the head of the pantheon because he was not the one doing most of the speaking. He was more reserved and sitting back. And maybe people talk about Paul's looks as not being particularly winsome or, or likable compared to others. So maybe Barnabas looked perhaps more respectable than the Apostle Paul did. But Paul was the chief speaker. And so Mercurius or Mercury, or in the, the Greek version of it, Hermes, right? He was known as being the messenger of the gods. And because he spoke so much because he was the chief speaker it says here that's who they thought they were this whole thing is going on right now and paul and barnabas are still not entirely sure what's happening but there is a, an uproar and so perhaps they're hoping that these folks really got it they understood we were talking about christ we were preaching the gospel we were trying to help them understand who the the true and living god is who is the creator of all things and we're trying to, to explain to them that they need to turn away from their empty gods that have never helped them to the true Savior. And so they're all excited when they see the miracle until verse 13. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands under the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people. So the priest of, of one of their pagan temples starts to get all of the necessary implements in order to have sacrifice, to make sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas, thinking that they were gods. And they start to realize that something has gone terribly wrong. As the whole city marches to the gates of the city, which is the gathering part where people would come in and out, where markets would pop up, where people were greeted, uh, where decisions were made in the gates, they come to the gates of the city and there's all of these oxen lined up and they're trying to put, it says garlands, they're trying to put stuff probably on Paul and Barnabas is a way to honor them, trying to string them with flowers or beads or things along those lines. And they were planning on offering a sacrifice to them. But in verse 14, which when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out. So when they realized what happened, they thought these people aren't excited that we're the messengers of Christ. They think that we are they're pagan gods. They think that we are part of their pantheon come down. In fact, the exact opposite thing. Imagine if you were a missionary and you went into a people and you were preaching the gospel and the response of the people to the gospel was to practice their own false religion harder, to practice it more fervently. You'd be very upset. You would think we have really done the wrong thing. It says that they rent their clothes Right, right around the neckline, they would have grabbed their garment and pulled down and probably ripped it four or five inches is the, the general practice. It shows that you're greatly pained, you're greatly grieved, something terrible has gone on, and it's an outward expression of that. And they did that. It would have been known and understood in this area. And they were in and running around the people trying to get their attention, trying to get them to stop the sacrifices to their pagan gods. That's the exact opposite of what they had come there to do. Worshiping another god was sinful, but for them to be the cause of it would have been very grievous to Paul and Barnabas, knowing that somehow they had allowed this to happen. You see, there was a glory that was due unto the name of the Lord, and this glory was going to be given to these false gods. So in Acts chapter 14, in verse number 14, excuse me, 15, and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you. He says, why are you doing this? What are you doing? We are just men. We have the same feelings. We're just like you. We're not gods. We haven't come down from anywhere. In fact, this is the opposite of what it is that we've been after you to do. It says, we are also men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God. Vanity. What is a, a vanity? You're probably thinking about the, the sink and countertop in your bathroom. That is one meaning of the word vanity. But if we were to use the Bible understanding of the word vanity, we're talking about something that's empty, 
We're talking about something that has no substance. It might appear as though there's something to it, but there's really nothing there. The general idea that comes to my mind is cotton candy. Cotton candy looks big when you have it on that little stick and it's large and fluffy, but when you bite into it, there's nothing there and it immediately disappears on your, on your tongue. And that's what these vanities are. He says, the gods that you're serving, these religious practices that you're involved in, they're empty. They are no gods. Many times throughout the Bible, there is a clear call um, to not worship idols and that the idols are not real and they can't help you. They can't hear you. They don't see. They don't know what's going on. And so why would you give yourself to them? And so they're saying this is exactly what we were saying you shouldn't do. You should turn from these vanities unto the living God. The major difference between the idols and the statues that they had and the living God was these are dead stone even precious stone, even decorated, they're still dead. And that God, even though you cannot see him, is living and alive and is powerful. And who is this God which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein? We want you to know who we're talking about. We're not talking about one of your, your human superheroes that you've come up with. We're talking about the God who made everything. We're talking about the creator God. We're talking about someone who is so much greater than your pantheon or than any ideas that you have. This is who. And there is a call to turn from one before you worship the other. There is a danger that sometimes happens in missionary work where people do not turn from their old gods, but they add in Jesus Christ. They add in the teachings of the church. We can see that the historical impact of that in different places around the world, such as South America and Central America, there were a lot of pagan practices that were never properly dealt with. And so when the, the Catholic Church came in and expanded their influence there, they allowed them to mix their folk religion in with the teachings of the Catholic Church. If you've ever seen the celebrations of the Day of the Dead and all of this, you've got this weird mixture of pseudo-Catholic worship alongside all of their folklore and folk religion. And in some places, you could go and say, you need to trust Jesus Christ as Savior. And they'd be like, that sounds great. I'll do that. And you could get all excited about it, only to realize that they've added Jesus in their own mind to the shelf of gods that they already have. There are some cultures where they don't just have one god that they worship. They worship many gods. And it's no problem to them if you want to bring them another god that they can worship. But the Lord Jesus Christ is not to be put on a shelf with other gods and worshipped as one of many. In fact, God was very clear that you're not supposed to have any graven images and there shall be no God before him, right? That's not supposed to be done at all. And so you cannot come to the true and living God without first turning away from the false religion that they were a part of or else you end up with what people call syncretism where you try and match the two together and you just end up with a mess. So what ends up happening? Paul continues on and says, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Verse 17, nevertheless left, excuse me, nevertheless he left not himself without witness and that he did give good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. He says, you may not be familiar with this God. You may not have heard of it. There may be a, a time when you didn't know and recognizing that God has not dealt with all peoples as he's dealt with Israel. But if we were to have time, we could go to the book of Romans and we would look where it says, so people through what is inside of them in the witness of nature. In fact, let's turn there briefly. I don't have these in the slides, I don't believe. But in Romans chapter one, in Romans chapter one, In verse number 18, Romans chapter 1 and verse number 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Verse 19, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. There's really three different ways that we learn about God. You have some general ways and then one very specific way. The general ways, the first one, it talks about that which is in them. 
right? So their own conscience, the witness that God has within them, talks of a creator God to whom they are responsible and that they have grieved him. Nature itself speaks of the power of God, the authority and power of the, God, of the Godhead, so that they can look. And there is enough evidence of a creator God that we have offended out there so that the conclusion of this is that they are without excuse. No one can say, I didn't know that there was a God to whom I was beholden, that there was a God to whom I didn't know that I was supposed to behave. It says they, they have no excuse because it's already inside of them. And so that gives you enough to know that you're in trouble, but to know salvation, you need that specific revelation, which is what the word of God is. It tells us exactly who it is. Lots of people have looked at the world and said that there was a God and have come up with all sorts of ways of explaining who that God is, or maybe gods or maybe spirits. That's where we get a lot of the folk religion that's around the world is people in their own ignorance as their forefathers progressively denied who God was and knowledge of him passed away from their families. And that's how you get a lot of these pagan religions that um, they, they don't know him. And so that is why missionaries go and why missionaries bring that specific revelation of who God is. And so notice how they talk about the Lord here. They haven't dealt with a bunch of prophecies that we can see here in Isaiah that, that Jesus fulfilled. They haven't gone into how Jesus is the completion of the law. They have to start at a different place because these people are in a different place. They don't know the promises of the Messiah. They're, they're pagan Gentiles. They have no idea that God even had a Savior planned all the way back in the Old Testament. No idea of that. So they had to start, and they had to say, all the stuff you think that Zeus is doing for you by giving you fruitful seasons and, and doing good unto you and providing for you, all that stuff that you thought Zeus was, that's not Zeus. That's not Jupiter. That is the true and living God. All the good things that you enjoy, they came from him. And so they're trying to take them from where they are with what they know and get them to where they need to be, taking that into account. And we fact, in fact, we see that later on when Paul preaches again in, in a different culture when he's in Athens. It says in verse 18, And with these sayings, scarce restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. They, they managed to stop the sacrifice to them. They managed to convince them that they were not Jupiter or Zeus, that they were not Hermes or Mercury, that they were just people preaching a different God than what they'd thought. I don't know that they convinced everybody that they needed to believe, but at least they convinced them that they themselves were not these gods come down. So what do we take away from this unusual happening in this city? Points of application. First of all, cultivate your faith in God. Cultivate your faith in God. Why is that? Well, there's a connection here between God's mighty work and the faith of his people. Did you notice that when we started reading together, when Paul was looking at him, he said he perceived that he had faith to be healed. That there is a, a correlation, there is a connection between people of great faith and them receiving God's great blessings. If you would look in Hebrews chapter 11 for a moment, would you turn there? Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 6. Perhaps some of you have this, God mem or this verse about the Lord memorized. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So without faith, we try and come to God, we're not going to receive what we think we're going to receive. We must believe that God is real and that he is there and that he's going to answer us, that he's a rewarder of us, that when we actually seek him, we expect him to answer. In James, if you'll turn over just a few pages, James chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Speaking of people praying to God for wisdom when they need it, James chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. So again, here's another situation in which the faith of the person is directly connected into whether or not they're going to receive what it is they're asking for. The necessity of faith. There was a verse I wanted to bring up earlier that I, I did not do so, but it's Matthew. Matthew chapter 
13 in verse number 58, speaking of the Lord Jesus when he was in his own hometown where he grew up. Matthew 13 and verse 58. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So when he went back to his own town, when he was, uh, where he was at Nazareth, and he tried to explain who he was, they did not receive him as such. And they said, we know you, you're Mary's son, and, and we knew your father and all that, and you're saying that you're the Messiah? And he said, a prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So there's a direct connection in our faith in God, our belief in God, and receiving what he desires to do for us, and our lack of belief. Now you say, how much faith does a person need to have in order to be healed? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know that we're given all of the details about these things. But it was such, and Paul had this understanding, and this could have been a part of that time period of the apostles where uh, he had this gift of discernment and he knew what was going on in someone's heart and he realized that the miracle of healing could be made for this man and so he did so. I don't know. We're not told everything. We know that miracles were given to the apostles to validate the truth of the gospel. Lots of superstition, lots of gods, lots of people traveling around and preaching, but not lots of power. Not like Paul and Barnabas displayed when they, they spoke and they did miracles in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So for you and I, we're not going to have these same apostolic sign gifts, but there is a connection in our prayer life and pleasing God and receiving from the Lord, and it's connected with our faith. And I think this passage encourages us to have that kind of faith. Pardon me one moment. There we go. Second of all, desire for God to get the glory. Desire for God to get the glory. A great miracle had been done in Jesus' name. However, these pagans were about to offer sacrifices of praise and thanks to these false gods. Even worse, they were going to do it to Paul and Barnabas, thinking that they were them. And those idols and those pagan gods are nothing but evil spirits. That's the scary thing that oftentimes sounds insulting to people, and so we, we back off of it. You say, why would somebody worship something that's not real? Why would somebody maintain faith in a false religion? Well, there's something going on behind the, stream, the, the, behind the scenes in 1 Corinthians, would you turn there? 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in verse number 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. There's speaking about the offerings that people would make to these pagan statues. Pagan is pretty much any of these old religions that don't refer to the true and living God of the Bible. It's sort of a catch-all term. And it says the Gentiles, they do sacrifices, right? They make sacrifices, and it's not to God when they do it. Some people teach, well, if you believe in anything sincerely enough, then somehow that gets redirected to God. Well, the Scripture does not agree with that. Scripture says that what's behind the, the scene are devils. The devils are behind this. So you say, what's, what's behind false religion? Demonic activity. Satan himself. You say, I've, I've, you say Christianity comes in power, but I've heard of miracles and strange things happening in other religions. And I would say, I don't, I don't necessarily disbelieve you. I believe you probably saw some kind of wonder. But the Bible refers to them as lying wonders. Because there is a power behind it. There's really only two places to find supernatural power. It's either with God or with evil spirits. It's either with God or with Satan. And so they are the reality behind the religion that these men were going to worship. And so it pained Paul and Barnabas to see that God was not going to get the glory. And what does it mean for God to get the glory? It means he ought to get the credit. If anyone's going to look good from this situation, let's make God look good. If we do something and people are trying to praise us for it, we should redirect them back to God. We should say, you know, well, thank you very much. God has been very good to me. Or I love that I can bless you this way because God has blessed me this way. And so you just keep pointing it back to the Lord so that it's not us trying to get the glory. 
we must make sure God gets the credit because everything that I have or that's good and everything that I do that's good really comes back to the Lord. So let's point others to glorify God. By the way, it's amazing how much can be accomplished when we don't care who gets the credit, earthly speaking. You know, we don't have to have everybody patting us on the back. We can get a lot more done by just pointing people to the Lord instead of worrying about who takes the credit, humanly speaking. Lastly, consider <clears throat> your audience when sharing the gospel. Consider your audience when sharing the gospel. Pagan Gentiles had very different religious views than the yet-to-be-convinced Jewish people did. And because of that, we see Paul starting with them in a different place when he describes who the true and living God is. Did you notice him going back to talking about how he made all things and the good that you've received and anything that you've enjoyed in this world? That's the true and living God, not Zeus, not Jupiter. He had to go back to the very beginning. If you walked up to a Jewish person and you started talking about God, you have a whole bunch you've already built on based on their understanding. They believe in a monotheistic, meaning a one God religion. The, the pagans had no idea of that. They had many gods. In fact, our Christian forefathers were considered to be atheists by their enemies because they didn't believe in enough gods. They only believed in one. And so that was one of the, the terms that they threw around of, of our Christian forefathers in those first three centuries of church history. They were considered to be atheists because they would not believe in all of the gods of the pantheon. Interesting thing to think about now when we think about atheists. And so he had to consider the people he was talking to in order to get them to understand, especially because they only had a few moments to stop the sacrifice from going on. So when you're considering the person that you're talking to, it's important to know their religious background. It's important to know when they are talking about God, what is it that they mean when they say his name? What might they know or what might they not know? What misunderstandings might arise? This requires us to learn about the person that we're speaking to, right? It's, it's very interesting. Um, you know, sometimes you'll see people wearing a cross on a necklace, and you might think, oh, that person believes in Jesus. They're wearing a cross. And you might talk with them and find out they're just wearing it because they like how it looks. It may have nothing to do with that. I've seen people that had the Egyptian symbol of the Ankh. Anybody know what that looks like? It's kind of got a circle around the top and a, a little bit of a line through it coming down. It's an Egyptian symbol. And you would, you would think if someone was wearing that, that they were worshiping the Egyptian gods. But if you ask them, they just thought it was cool and edgy, maybe, at some point. And so they decided to do that. And you kind of get an idea about what people believe by speaking with them. Um, as you can see, my arm's in a sling, and I had a, a fun trip to the emergency room last night. And my doctor had a very particular head wrap on. And he also had bands on his arm. And those things told me this man is a practicing Sikh which is a, a very rare religion. There's not a lot of Sikhs uh, around. That's S-I-K-H, if you're not familiar with that. Um, and so the, um, they also are supposed to carry some sort of ceremonial dagger once they become of age. And I was wondering if somewhere under his scrubs he had that thing, though I was not about to ask because my mind was elsewhere at the time. Um, so you get the, a feel for people and you, you start differently when you speak with different people. It requires us to, to learn. And so how do you? Well, if you start the conversation, you might share about uh, things going on in your life, in your church, and reading the Bible and all that, and be like, have, have you ever been to church before? You know, have you ever actually read any of the Bible? Have you ever done it? And get, get a feel for it. Or ask them if what they're wearing does have any religious significance. And take time to hear their views, not because you necessarily agree with them, but because we need to achieve clarity when we share the gospel, or else we may be talking this way, and they may be talking that way, and nobody understands each other at the end of our gospel conversation. So people are flattered when they believe that we care about what they think as well, and that's also a good way, because we do care about what they think so that we can get the gospel across their path so that they know. A few questions. A few questions along this line before we have our prayer time together. What kind of misunderstandings might arise if you're speaking to an unsaved, unchurched person about the gospel? Never been in church before. 
Don't know anything about it. What kind of, as opposed to somebody who is maybe an unsaved religious person or an atheist, what, what about a completely unchurched person? What kind of misunderstandings might arise? Language. All right, language. For example... Yes. Even salvation, sin, um, you know, simple things like that. Right. There's a very good chance that people have no idea about that. And so you may be talking about God and they have no concept of what you mean by that. Or they have a wrong concept. That's true. What else might come up as a, uh, something that might be confusing? What's that? Are you born again? Yes. And they'd be like, I didn't know that was an option. Yeah. True. Tony? You might think you're perfect. Okay. Yeah, there's a tend to think that either that we're perfect or we're pretending or claiming to be perfect. Yeah, a lot of unchurched people have been told that those church people, they're judgy. And they're going to look down on you. What other confusions might come up? Yeah, Tony? That you're better than them. Okay, that we think we're better than them. One of the things that I've run into is I'll say, well, the Bible says, and I'll explain something out of Scripture, and they're like, well, why should I care what the Bible says? Right? No idea that the Bible's the Word of God. No idea that it's what it is and the, the perfectness of it and how you can look into the depths of it and it just keeps complementing itself and the cross connections of it. It's, it's pretty amazing of a book, but they might not know. What about if you're speaking to an unsaved religious person? What kind of confusion might come up? Yeah, Ron? Yes, you have to work your way to heaven. So when you say, you know, you need to trust Jesus, they might hear, oh, and be a good person, Right? I've had that happen. David? Yes, some of the terms we use, they might think it means something else. That's true. Because they've been throwing around religious words where they're at. What else might come up with it? Pardon? Mm -hmm. right there's a tendency to trust something other than christ by faith right baptism works communion confirmation oh yeah definitely so, some very uh what you call liturgical high church type environments when they talk about what saves you they'll talk that taking communion has a part in your salvation and other things like that. So it's very confusing when you start to tell somebody it's simply um, by grace through faith alone. Anybody else have a thought on that? Yes. Well, and, and if you were to talk to a religious person that's lost, they would think they know what goes on in church. They would absolutely say, oh yeah, I know what goes on in church. I went to church. So when you invite them to church and they're like, ah, I don't want that. Well, they probably haven't been here. I remember having been in those high liturgical ceremonial type churches growing up. And then I walked into a Baptist church and it was very different. Very different. I'm like, where are the icons? Where's the incense? Where are the candles that I need to light? You know, where's the thing I need to make the sign of the cross for and bow and kiss? You know, there were all these things that I was used to. I'm like, this guy's speaking English. That was new. The churches I grew up in, the guy was speaking a foreign language. You know, very rarely was it in English. And even when it was in English, his accent was so thick, I could not understand what he was saying. Right? So even that was different. So yeah, people might think that they already know what goes on. What about somebody from a completely non-Christian religion? 
right? What if you run into a Hindu person or a Buddhist person or someone who believes in spiritism or something like that? What kind of misunderstandings might crop up? Yeah, David? Right. They think that all Christians, including the Catholic Church, that everything's the same. And it's really not, right? We get grouped together. And so they, they might accuse us of things that perhaps... Because ironically, even though they group us with the Catholic Church, our forefathers were persecuted by the Catholic Church and actually put to death, if you look into the history of our Baptist forefathers. So we're really not all the same. We're really not all the same. That's true. What else might come up with someone from a completely different... Yep, Larry? You might say, well, I have my religion, you have yours. Right. Right? Many world religions don't require you to believe just what they believe to be fine. Right. Right. There, there is a, a generous sense of pluralism to these God, these non-exclusionary religions, right? These non-monotheistic religions. Yeah, Ben? Yes. So again, just a misunderstanding of what it is that we believe. And at the same time, I can't claim to know what everybody else believes, right? But if I'm having a conversation with somebody, getting that background understanding so that we're not talking past each other is very important. Or else you may end up with one of those strange conversations where they might even say that they agree with you and that they do want to become a Christian, but that they don't understand that that means leaving what they have to believe, or excuse me, leaving what they believed before. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the clarity of your word. We thank you for the truth of the gospel. How even these, these pagan folks that had no understanding of you whatsoever still got to hear, and this one believed, the one who was, who was crippled from birth was willing to believe, and enough so that you could do this miracle through him. And so we rejoice in your patience, we rejoice in your ability to, to break boundaries of culture and through false religion, and I pray that you'd continue to do so. Use us, help us to be wise witnesses, help us to have greater faith that you might do greater works in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.